The desert smelled like dead folks. The sun hung over our heads, fat and swollen, like that Polish whore back in Red Creek. It made me sweat, just like she had. It felt like we were breathing soup. The heat made the stench worse. Our dirty handkerchiefs, crusted with sand and blood, were useless. They stank almost as bad as the desert. Of course, it wasn't the desert that stank. It was the things chasing us. We'd been fleeing through the desert for days. None of us had a clue where we were. Lepo knew the terrain and had acted as our guide, but he died of heat stroke on the second day, and we shot him in the head before he got back up again. We weren't sure if the disease affected folks who died of natural causes, but we figured it was better to be safe than sorry. Since then, we've been following the sun, searching horizons for something other than sand or dead things. Our canteens were empty, so were our bellies. We baked during daylight and froze at night. All things considered, I'd have rather been in Santa Fe. I knew folks there, had friends, a girl. From what we'd heard, the disease hadn't made it that far yet. Riding behind me and Deke, Jorge muttered something in Spanish. I've never been able to get the hang of that language, so I'm not sure what he said. Sounded like, there's goats in the pool, but it probably wasn't. I slumped forward in the saddle while my horse plodded along. My tongue felt like sandpaper. My lips were cracked and swollen. I kept trying to lick them, but I couldn't work up any spit. They still back there? I was too tired to turn around and check for myself. Still there, Hogan. I wiped sweat from my eyes. We push these horses any harder, and they're going to drop right out from under us, and we'll be fucked. Behind us, Janelle gasped at my language. I didn't care. According to the Reverend, it was the end of the world. I figured rough language was the least of her worries. The good Lord will deliver us. Even you, Mr. Hogan. Appreciate that, Reverend. Give him my thanks the next time you two talk. Deke rolled his eyes. I grinned, even though it hurt my lips. We were an odd bunch, to be sure. Deke and I had come to Red Creek just a month ago. We'd bought ourselves a stand of timber there, and we were intent on clearing it. Jorge had worked at the livery. The Reverend was just that. Had himself a tent on the edge of town, and gave services every Sunday. Terry was just a kid, couldn't have been a day over 14. No hair on his chin yet, but he shot like a man, and I was pretty sure he was sweet on Janelle. It was easy to see why. Women like her were hard to find in the West. Janelle was from Philadelphia, come to Red Creek after marrying a dandy twice her age. Don't know if she really loved him or not, but she'd certainly carried on when those corpses tore the old boy apart in front of the apothecary like a pack of starved coyotes. Red Creek wasn't a big town, but it was large enough that none of us had known each other until we fled together. Except for me and Deke, we were strangers, thrown together by circumstance. That made for an uneasy ride. The first any of us heard of the disease was when a man stumbled into town one night, feverish and moaning. There was a nasty bite on his arm and a chunk of flesh missing from his thigh. The doc took care of him as best he could, but the poor bastard died just the same. Before he did, he told the doc and his helpers about Hamlin's revenge. That's what folks back east were calling it, on account of some story about a piper and some rats. The disease started with rats. They overran a reservation back east, which wasn't a surprise as far as I was concerned. I'd seen the conditions on those reservations and figured those people would be better off sleeping at the bottom of an outhouse. It was a terrible way to live. The thing is, these weren't no ordinary rats. They were dead, guts hanging out, maggots clinging to their bodies, but they still moved and bit. And whatever they bit got sick and died. Mostly they bit the natives. The natives took ill and died off, and the government didn't seem to care until the natives came back and started eating white folks. By then it was too late. The man told the doc about this and then died. Doc got some of the town bigwigs together, and while they were having a meeting about it, 
the dead fella got back up and ate the doc's helpers. Then they came back and started eating folks too. Hamlin's revenge spread fast, hopping from person to person, other species too. Before we hightailed it out of Red Creek, I saw dead horses, dogs, and coyotes attacking townspeople in the streets. And lots of dead people, of course. By then, there were more corpses stumbling around than there were live folks. Lucky for us, the dead moved slowly, otherwise we'd have never escaped. Even then, it wasn't easy. They swarmed, trapping us inside the saloon. We had to fight our way out. Burned most of Red Creek down in the process. How do you kill something that's already dead? Shooting them in the head seems to work. So does smacking them in the head with a hammer, or a pickaxe, or a length of kindling. You can fire six shots into their chest, and they'll keep on coming. You can chop off their arms and legs, and they'll keep wriggling like a worm on a hook. But get them in the head, and they drop like a sack of grain. I glanced up at the sky, squinting. The sun hadn't moved. It felt like we hadn't either. Our horses shuffled through the sand, wobbling unsteadily. Janelle coughed. I turned around to see if she was okay. She fanned her hand in front of her nose. When she saw me looking at her, she frowned. They're getting closer, Mr. Hogan, judging by that stench. I know. What do you intend to do about it? I looked past her, studying the horizon. There were hundreds of black dots, dead things. The population of Red Creek, and then some. Every infected animal had joined in the pursuit, too. I'll give the dead one thing. They're determined sons of bitches. I intend to keep moving. Stay ahead of them. We don't have enough bullets to kill them all. And even if we did, I reckon they're out of range. Ain't none of us gunslingers. Even if we were, nobody's that good of a shot. Not even your boyfriend there. I nodded in Terry's direction. The boy blushed. Scowling, Janelle stuck her nose into the air. I turned around again, trying to hide my grin. Deke chuckled beside me. She's taking a shine to you. I shrugged. It took a lot of effort to do so. I was trying to work up enough energy to respond when something ahead of us caught my eye. The flat landscape was broken by a smattering of low hills. It looked like God had just dropped them right there in the middle of the desert. Jorge must have seen it too because he jabbered and pointed. Look there. Deke patted his horse's flank. We could hole up atop one of them hills, make a stand, shoot them as they climb up. Until we run out of bullets, then we'd be surrounded. We could drop boulders on them. Don't know about that, but I reckon we'll make for those hills anyway. Maybe if those things lose sight of us, they'll give up. Or maybe there's something on the other side. Water? Terry's tone was hopeful. Before I could answer him, the sky got dark. We glanced upward. Janelle screamed. Jorge made a kind of choking sound. Deacon Terry gasped. The Reverend muttered a prayer. I just stared in shock. The sky was full of dead birds. They moved like they were alive, circling and careening as one but slow. Parts of them kept falling off. They stank. The flock headed right for us, dropping down like hail. Ride! I dug my heels into my horse's sides, hoping she had more energy than I did. Apparently she had some reserves, because she took off like lightning, stirring up clouds of dust beneath her hooves. Deke's mare did the same, keeping pace with us. The others rumbled along behind us. I looked around for some cover, but there wasn't any. Head for them hills! Might be some trees or a cave! I glanced over my shoulder to make sure that Jorge understood the plan, and what I saw stopped me cold. Janelle sat motionless, face upturned, gaping at the flock of dead birds. Her horse danced nervously beneath her. Terry held on to her horse's reins and kept his own mount in check. He was urging Janelle to flee, but if she heard him, she gave no sign. As I rode up to them, Terry fumbled with his shotgun. His hands were shaking, and he was having one hell of a time freeing it. I grabbed his arm. 
He looked up at me, and I saw the fear in his eyes. It echoed my own. Don't bother. All you'll do is waste ammunition. Skin on out of here. He glanced at Janelle. But, Miss Perkins. I've got her. You go on and ride. He stared at me, clearly reluctant to leave Janelle's side. I reckon he had visions of coming to her rescue, and then she'd repay him by sharing his bedroll, if we ever found a safe place to make camp. But I went ahead and crushed those dreams. We didn't have time for nonsense. Go on now. I slapped his horse on its rear. Get! It took off after the others, and I turned to Janelle. I seized her horse's bridle and gave it a tug. The mare whinnied, baring her teeth. Janelle did the same thing. I hollered at them both as the birds drew closer. I don't reckon Janelle heard me over the terrible racket the birds were making. Frustrated, I turned my horse around and kept a grip on Janelle's mount too. My other hand clutched my colt. I knew it was pointless as a defense against the birds, but having it in my hand made me feel better. I squeezed my mount with my legs and prodded her on, hoping Janelle's mare would keep up with us. She did, for about the first 200 yards. Then fatigue, heat, and thirst took their toll. She stumbled, snorted, and then sagged to the ground. She didn't fall. If she had, that might have been it for Janelle and I both. Instead, the horse sort of eased down. I snatched Janelle from the saddle and plopped her down behind me. She slapped my shoulders, pulled my hair, and insisted we go back for her horse. I ignored her. Gritting my teeth, I spurred my mount on even harder. I only looked back once. What I saw made me glad and sad at the same time. Screeching and squawking, the birds fed on Janelle's horse, covering it from head to toe, pecking at its eyes and flesh. But they weren't chasing us anymore, now that they had easier pickings. Deke and the others waited for us. I shouted at them to go on. Wasn't any sense in wasting our momentary advantage. The birds would strip that carcass soon enough. Then they, and whatever was left of Janelle's horse, would be back up again and after us, along with all those other dead things loping along behind us. We caught up with them, and I found myself in the lead again. Deacon Jorge flanked me. Terry and the Reverend rode along behind. I kept my eyes on the foothills and said nothing, but I noticed the wounded, hurt look that Terry gave Janelle and me. The day grew hotter. I wished it would rain. We lost Jorge's horse before we reached the hills. The rest of our mounts were stumbling badly, the last of their strength spent. Jorge wept as he took a hatchet to the poor animal. I wondered how he managed the tears. I was so dry, I couldn't spit, let alone cry. We all dismounted, leading our horses the rest of the way. I didn't much cotton to the idea, but it was either that or let them keep dropping out from underneath us. Janelle complained about having to walk but none of us paid her any mind, except for Terry, who offered to carry her. He blushed, withering under her scornful glare, while the rest of us chuckled at the image of Janelle riding piggyback on his shoulders across the desert. The terrain changed, becoming rockier. Soon enough, we reached the foothills. Deke stopped us, shading his eyes with his hands. Y'all see what I see? We looked where he was pointing, and I whistled. I'll be damned. There was a narrow canyon entrance wedged between two of the hills. The landscape seemed to arch over it, and for a moment it almost looked like a door. Then I wiped the sweat from my eyes and looked again. Nope, no door. Just sloping canyon walls, shadowed, and probably a lot cooler than where we were standing. Let's make for that. At the very least, it'll get us out of the sun for a spell and give us a place to hide. Might even be a stream or a pool. The others seemed to brighten at this. They picked up their pace. Even the horses seemed to sense that our luck was changing. They trudged forward with renewed strength. I looked back the way we'd come. There were a few birds circling in the haze. From that distance, I couldn't tell if they were dead or not, but they weren't heading in our direction. There were, however, three small objects limping across the desert. Judging by their size and movements, I'd figured them for dead dogs or coyotes. They were too far away to be any real danger, but I figured we should put some distance between them and us. 
We made our way into the canyon mouth, and again I was reminded of a door. We went single file, Deacon me in the lead, and Jorge and Terry bringing up the rear. A cool breeze dried the sweat on my forehead. I smiled. Despite everything we'd been through, I suddenly felt better than I had in days. Underneath those sloping cliff walls, the sun couldn't touch us. With luck, the dead wouldn't either. The passage narrowed. There was a slight but noticeable downward descent. It went on like that for a while, then the walls pressed closer. I was just about to doubt that we'd be able to squeeze the horses through it when the canyon rounded a corner and opened wide. I stood there gaping, half convinced that what I was seeing was a mirage, until Deke cleared his throat behind me. Get a move on, Hogan. What's the holdup? See for yourself. I moved my mount aside so that they could come through. One by one, they walked out of the narrow fissure and stopped, sharing my reaction. This sure ain't on no map I've seen. No, I don't reckon it is. Spread out before us, from one horizon to the other, was the biggest damned valley I've ever seen. It was filled with all kinds of trees and plants, things that had no business growing in the desert. The lush green foliage was quite a shock after the barren wasteland we'd just crossed. A broad, clear stream ran through the center of the valley, not quite a river, but too big to be a creek. The air in the valley was different. It smelled just like the aftermath of a thunderstorm, and it was more humid, but not as hot as the desert had been. Although we couldn't see any, the trees and bushes echoed with the sounds of wildlife, deep-throated rumblings and shrill bird calls like nothing I'd ever heard before. Understand, this wasn't just some desert oasis. This was an entire hidden valley, nestled between the surrounding canyon hills. The terrain was unlike the rest of the desert. I couldn't figure out how such a thing could be. The Reverend must have been thinking the same thing. If I didn't know better, I'd think I was back home. Why is that? Because it reminds me of the forests back home. It's an oasis. Too big for that. It's a whole valley. Janelle stared at the treetops, swaying in the breeze. How is... how is this possible? Wouldn't someone in Red Creek have known about this? Does it matter? Whether they knew about it or not, we're here now. I reckon the Reverend ought to thank God for us, because as far as I'm concerned, our prayers have been answered. We've got shelter, shade, food, and water. These trees will hide us from those dead birds. We led the horses down to the stream. The thick undergrowth slapped our legs and brushed against our faces. Clouds of mosquitoes and gnats buzzed around our eyes and ears, but we didn't pay them any mind. Unlike the dead, the bugs only ate a little bit. The horses drank eagerly. We did the same thing, laughing and splashing. The water was cold and clear, which struck me as odd. There'd been no snow atop the hills. Running in from the desert, the stream shouldn't have been so frigid. Drinking it made my teeth hurt, but I didn't care. I gulped it down until my stomach cramped, then I threw up and drank some more, splashing water across my face. Whooping, Deke plunged into the stream and waded out until the water was up to his waist. Terry, Jorge, and I stripped off our gear and followed him. I turned back to Janelle and the Reverend, who were watching us from the bank. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> I doubt that. Your skin is turning blue. Hell, my damn balls are shriveling up. We all chuckled at that, even Janelle. Terry and Jorge splashed each other. Deke ducked below the surface and came back up sputtering. I motioned to Janelle and the Reverend. Seriously, y'all should come on in. <laughs> I'm fine here. It wouldn't be ladylike. The Reverend shook his head. I am, uh, I'm afraid that I can't swim, Mr. Hogan. It ain't that deep. Before the Reverend could respond, Jorge interrupted. What's he saying? Jorge put one finger to his lips and cupped his ear with his other hand. I don't hear nothing. The bushes along the stream bank rustled. 
The horses whinnied and glanced around, stomping their feet. I reached for my pistol, realizing too late that I'd left it on the shore with the rest of my gear. Then the undergrowth parted, and Janelle and the Reverend both screamed. I was expecting another dead thing, maybe a horse or a person, but what charged out of the bushes was no corpse. It was the biggest damn lizard I'd ever seen. It stood on its hind legs, towering over the horses, about 15 feet long from head to tail, and probably weighing a ton. Despite its size, the thing moved fast. Arms outstretched, it ran on two legs towards Janelle and the Reverend. Each hand had three fingers. The middle fingers were equipped with claws the size and shape of a grain sickle. It had a big head and an even bigger mouth full of arrowhead-sized teeth. Its tongue flicked the air as it made a hissing, throaty sort of roar. Shrieking, Janelle dove into the stream. The Reverend ran after her. I noticed that he'd pissed his pants. He paused, glancing back and forth from the water to the lizard, as if trying to decide which one he feared the most. The creature slashed the throat of Terry's mount. The poor beast took two faltering steps and then fell over. The other horses scattered. As they did, three more giant lizards emerged from the bushes and attacked them. The cries the horses made as they were slaughtered was one of the worst sounds I've ever heard. We hurried to the far side of the stream while the lizards busied themselves with their kills, tearing and ripping, sticking their snouts into the horses' abdomens and rooting around. I glanced back and noticed that the reverend had waded into the water up to his knees. He stood there trembling, watching in horror as the lizards feasted. Come on, while they're distracted! He shook his head. Somebody has to help him. One of you, get back over there. The hell with that. I ain't even going back for my gear. You think I'd go back for him? He is a man of God. Then I reckon God'll keep him safe. Either that, or he'll meet God real soon. I'll get him. Terry splashed into the stream. Cursing, I jumped in after him. Hogan, where the hell are you going? Get back here! Our guns are over there. We're going to need them. That was my excuse anyway. Deep down inside, I wondered if I was doing it for Janelle instead. I waited after Terry. We made it about halfway across the stream before pausing. The lizards were still eating. So far, they'd ignored the reverend. He stood there, glancing back and forth between them and us. His chin quivered, and his legs shook. Come on, reverend. I waved at him, trying to keep my voice low. The movement attracted the attention of one of the lizards. It raised its bloody snout and snorted, cocking its head sideways and studying Terry and me. I'd been charged by a bull once while crossing a pasture. The lizard had the same look in its eyes as the bull right before it charged. Terry, don't move. Just stay still. He nodded. The color drained from his face. Reverend, you need to get in this creek right now. It don't matter if you can't swim. Terry and I will carry you, but get your ass over here. Nodding, he inched forward. The water rippled around his knees. His lips moved in silent prayer. His eyes were closed. That's it. Easy now. Nice and slow. I glanced at the lizards. All four of them watched us now. They stood stiff and tense, ready to spring. One of them was missing an eye. The left side of its face was a mass of scar tissue left over from some long ago fight. Giants in the earth. Leviathan. It was hard to hear him over the churning water. What? It's a Bible verse, Mr. Hogan. There were giants in the earth in those days. Only verse I know is Jesus saves. Reckon I'll take your word for it. He stopped, gasping as the water reached his crotch. One of the lizards crept towards the stream. C c c cold. It's, it's, it's so cold. That's okay. We've got you. Terry, give him a hand. Hogan! Little busy right now. The lizard on the bank lowered its head and sniffed the spot where the reverend had been standing. 
The other three turned away from us and stared into the forest. I followed their gaze and saw why. The three dead coyotes I'd noticed earlier had followed us into the canyon. Now they stood under the tree line, watching us with blank, lifeless eyes. One of them was missing an ear. Another's broken ribs were sticking through its fur. They didn't pant, didn't growl. They just stared. Flies hovered around them in clouds. Oh, hell. The Reverend's eyes grew wider. What is it? What's wrong? He started to turn around, but I stopped him. Never you mind. Just give Terry your hand. Let's get out of here before they decide to have us for dessert. As Terry reached for the Reverend's trembling hand, the lizard on the bank leapt into the stream, splashing water over our heads. At the same time, the dead coyotes lumbered into the clearing. The other three lizards went for them. The one with the missing eye seized a coyote in its massive jaws and shook the corpse back and forth. The Reverend and Terry both slipped, sinking below the surface. They came up, sputtering and flailing. The Reverend clung to Terry's shoulders, almost dragged him back down again. The lizard surged forward, squealing. I splashed water at it in an attempt to scare it off, but all I did was make it swim faster. Let go! Can't breathe! Sobbing, the Reverend clutched him even tighter. They both went down again, and then the lizard was on them, close enough that I could feel its breath on my face. It smelled like rotten meat. Its jaws closed around Terry's head and lifted him out of the water. His legs and arms jittered, and I could hear him screaming inside its mouth. The creature gutted him from groin to neck with one of those sickle-shaped claws while holding the reverend beneath the surface with its hind legs. On the far shore, Janelle, Deke, and Jorge screamed. I backpedaled, unable to take my eyes off the slaughter. The lizard was busy with Terry and the Reverend, and paid me no mind. Neither did the other three. They feasted on the horses and coyotes. I stumbled out of the stream and shouted at the others to run. Without looking back, we plunged into the forest, panicked and terrified. Soon, the greenery swallowed us. We made camp inside a hollowed-out tree. I'd never seen anything like it before though I'd heard tell of some big trees out in California and reckoned this might be like them. It was large enough for the four of us to sit inside comfortably. The top had snapped off at some point, but the trunk was still standing. We were able to fashion a crude roof using leaves and branches. There were bugs inside, beetles and ants and such, bigger than I'd ever seen, but harmless. Janelle was afraid of them, but she was more afraid of what might be outside. All we had was what had been in our pockets, a bit of paper and a pencil, Deke's compass, a pouch of chewing tobacco, Janelle's frilly lace handkerchief, some money, and other odds and ends. It got cold after the sun went down. We had no matches or flint. We huddled together for warmth. Janelle fell asleep with her cheek resting on my shoulder. When she breathed, her breasts rubbed against my arm, soft and warm. That made everything we'd been through almost worth it. A few lizards passed by, close enough for us to see them. None of them were like the ones from the creek. One was the size of a cow, with a long neck and even longer tail. It sniffed around the base of the tree, but was more interested in eating leaves than it was in us. Another one, a baby judging by its size, had a bill like a duck. One of the creatures shook the ground as it lumbered by trees snapped, crashing to the earth. We saw its legs and hind end, but not the rest of it. Some of the lizards had feathers, most didn't. Right before sundown, the forest got real dark as something flew overhead. I poked my head out and looked up. Through the branches, I caught a glimpse of a flying creature with a 15-foot wingspan. It reminded me more of a bat than a bird. We stayed there all night. We didn't talk much. When we did, it was in short, hushed whispers so we wouldn't attract attention. Janelle and Deke slept. Jorge shut his eyes, but opened them every time there was a noise from the forest. Deke cried in his sleep, but I didn't mention it to him. After all, I cried too. Only difference was, my eyes were open. 
the next morning. What are they? Big damn lizards. I know that, but but where did they come from? I've got an idea. You all know about those big bones in the rocks that folks dig out of the ground, right? Sure. There's rich people who collect them. Janelle nodded. They're called fossils. All that remains of the dinosaurs. Yeah, that's the word. I reckon these lizards are living versions of those fossils. They're dinosaurs. The Reverend might have disagreed with you on that. He seemed to think that they were something out of the Bible. I don't remember any dinosaurs in the good book. Well, the Reverend is dead. I don't reckon he'll be any more help. Janelle frowned. You should be more respectful of the dead, Mr. Hogan. I usually am, but our recent experiences with the dead have soured me a bit. It's hard to be respectful of something when it's trying to eat you. But the Reverend wasn't like those dead. No, he wasn't. I reckon he was one of the lucky ones. You're forgetting one thing. I thought dinosaurs were supposed to be extinct. Somebody forgot to tell them that. Jorge glanced at each of us as we talked, clearly trying to follow the conversation. His expression was desperate. I smiled at him. He smiled back and then pointed outside. I'm with him. Let's get out of here. We need to find our way back to the desert. But, but the dead are still out there. They're here in the valley too, but there aren't any dinosaurs in the desert. Given a choice, I'd rather take my chances with just the dead rather than having to worry about them both. Deke rubbed the whiskers on his chin. You remember how to get back to the canyon entrance? No. I got all turned around when we ran. I was hoping one of you knew the way. Neither Deke nor Janelle remembered, and when we tried asking Jorge, he just stared at us in confusion and pointed outside again. Try your compass. Let's get a bearing on where we are and which direction we'll need to go. He pulled it out, wiped condensation from the lens, and then stared at it. What's wrong? Damned thing ain't working. It's just spinning round and round, like it can't find north. Let me see. I tried it for myself. Sure enough, the needle just kept spinning in a circle. I handed it back to him. How much did you pay for that? Five cents. That was five cents too much. It worked in the desert. Well, it ain't working now. Jorge pointed outside again. We can't just go stumbling around through this valley. We'll get eaten. That might be so, but we can't stay here either. Then what do you propose, Hogan? I say we head for the high ground. The valley is ringed by those hills. I say we get on top of one of them, and then work our way back down to the desert. Should be easy without the horses. That's another problem. With no mounts, how do we stay ahead of the dead once we make it out of here? They're slow, and judging by the shape those coyotes were in yesterday, I'd say the desert has been harder on them than it was on us. Long as we keep moving, we should be able to outpace them. With any luck, they'll fall apart before too much longer. And if you're wrong? I didn't have an answer for her. None of us did. Soon as it was light, we crept outside and held our breath. When nothing charged out of the undergrowth, we relaxed. I shimmied up a tree and got a fix on our location. The hills were there on the horizon ringing the valley. Pale clouds floated above them, almost touching their tips. I saw a few dinosaurs, long-necked, soft-eyed things with square, blunt teeth chewing on the treetops. It reminded me of cows. I shuddered, watching them warily. Big as they were, they could have reached me in no time. Luckily, they paid me no attention. We set off on our trek through the valley. I took the lead, followed by Deke and Janelle. Jorge brought up the rear. We went slowly, communicating with each other through hand gestures. The forest was full of animal noises, but they weren't sounds that I recognized. There were croaking raspy grunts, and long hisses, and chirps that sounded almost, but not quite, like birdsong. The first sound we recognized was a tree snapping, a loud crack, like a schoolmarm's paddle smacking someone's behind. 
We couldn't tell which direction it was coming from. Then we heard it crash to the ground. The forest floor vibrated with the impact. Another tree snapped. We caught a glimpse of the thing, a tail as long as a stagecoach and hind legs taller than a barn. It was walking away from us. We hurried straight ahead, not wanting to attract its attention. We moved so fast that we didn't see the dead dinosaur until it lurched out of the undergrowth. Janelle's shriek echoed through the valley. Deke and I dove to the side. Jorge stood there, gaping as it towered over him, staring down at him with one good eye. I recognized the lizard right away. It was the same one we'd encountered the day before. The missing eye and the scars on its face were unmistakable. When we'd last seen it, the dinosaur was still alive. Apparently the dead coyote it had eaten hadn't agreed with it, because now it was dead, infected with Hamlin's revenge. It already stank. A swarm of flies hovered around it. Its movements were sluggish, but it was still quick enough to catch Jorge. He tried to run, but it swiped at his back, plunging its talons into his skin and lifting him off the ground. Jorge jerked and jittered like a drunk at a square dance. He opened his mouth to scream and vomited blood instead. The lizard's claws burst through his chest. Then the dinosaur ripped him in half. I grabbed Janelle's hand and forced her to run with me. Deke was at my side, panting heavily. His cheeks were flushed. I wanted to ask him if he was all right, but couldn't spare the breath. We plunged through the greenery, heedless of where we were going or what was around us. One eye lumbered after us. We couldn't see him, but his steady thudding footfalls kept pace. The ground started to slope upward. The trees tilted forward, then thinned out. Janelle stumbled and fell, but I scooped her up in my arms and continued on. Deke's face turned beet red. He was drenched with sweat. Not much further. Just keep climbing. They nodded. Janelle tapped my shoulder, indicating that she wanted down. She was wobbly when she first tried to stand, but soon regained her footing. We scrabbled upward. The vegetation thinned to scrub, and the soil turned rocky. Huge boulders thrust from the earth. I glanced back down into the forest and saw treetops swaying back and forth as one eye passed beneath them. Then he lurched into sight. Without pausing, he started up the hill. It's no use. Deke mopped his brow with his shirt tail. That thing's dead. It won't tire. It'll just keep coming until we tuck her out and then get us. I ain't gonna let that happen. Well, how do you reckon you can stop it? Deke glanced back down at the dinosaur, creeping closer, but still a long way off. We ain't got any weapons. Sure we do. I patted the boulder next to me. Hogan, you've lost your damn mind. Deke stumbled to his feet. What are you gonna do, spit at it? No. When it gets closer, I'm gonna drop this rock on its head. That was your idea yesterday, remember? Will that work? Depends on whether I hit him or not. We waited for it to get closer. Janelle got nervous, but I calmed her down, assuring her that my plan would work. And it did. When the dinosaur got right below us, close enough that we could smell it again and hear the insects buzzing around its corpse, Deke and I rolled the boulder out over the ledge and dropped it right on the lizard's head. There was a loud crack, like the sounds the snapping tree trunks had made. One eye sank to the ground. The boulder tumbled down the hillside. After a moment, the twice-dead dinosaur did the same. Cheering, Janelle and Deke both hugged me. Then before I even realized what was happening, Janelle kissed me. Her lips were blistered and cracked from the sun, but I didn't mind. I pulled her to me and kissed her back. We didn't stop until Deke cleared his throat. You're probably right. Let's go. I'll race you to the top. We scrabbled to the summit, laughing and talking about our good fortune. It occurred to me that we should feel bad about Jorge and the others. And I did, of course. But at that moment, I was just happy to be alive. And even happier about that kiss. I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Hope. 
That sensation crumbled when we reached the summit. We stood there, unable to speak. Janelle began to cry. Instead of desert, spread out before us was more forest. An endless sea of green treetops swaying as things passed beneath them. I put my arm around Janelle. I don't think we're on the maps anymore, Deke. Deep in the valley below, something roared. I glanced over my shoulder. Another dinosaur emerged from the forest. Its head was as big as a full-grown buffalo, and its teeth were the size of tent pegs. It was obviously dead. It might have escaped extinction, but it couldn't escape Hamlin's revenge. Death is funny that way. In the end, it gets us all. As we ran, I wondered if one day folks would dig our bones out of the ground like they had the dinosaurs, and if so, which kind of dead we'd be. Thank you.